Did you see that clutch victory there? That was that was some time pressure. Uh, that, that was just some madness. That was the greatest time pressure display I've ever seen. Oh, thank you. Just save yes. a little for Pog Champs. I'll, I'll do my best. I'll try not to let it all out before then. How do you feel? So your first game's on Tuesday. How are you feeling? I was feeling great. Uh, I went on a huge tilt today. Uh, I went from 11, or I don't remember. I think it was 1100 or like okay. 50 all the way down to 980. Okay. I mean, that's like every day for me, basically. I mean, just add a couple thousand points, but same thing. <laughs> right, right, right. So you're playing Code Mika on Tuesday. Um, mm -hmm. If you're down for another session tomorrow, we'll, we'll leave the sort of specific preparation for tomorrow. I think she's mostly a beginner, so you're in pretty good shape. Great, that's good to hear. But a um, couple of things that you know I sort of want to get done before. We want to obviously get as much, you know, get you as warmed up as possible. So we'll do some tactics, we'll play some games, we'll play some odds. And, and obviously I want to polish up your openings. I want to do a quick review of black and then do the same thing we did last time, but with the Vienna, because you're definitely going to get it a lot during pot champs. Okay, that sounds good to me. Uh, maybe if you want to play like a five minute game or a 10 minute game, I think that's something that yeah. you can, just to approximate the pace, um, that would be awesome. Whichever, whichever one you prefer. All right, I'm hopping into a five minute game. Fantastic. There's a Sicilian, nice. Yeah, I've been doing a lot of work playing fast. You're a new man. I mean, just the speed of, wow, the pre-move, Jesus, yeah. who are you? I know, I'm, I, I can read this level like a book these days. It's incredible. Very good, queen c7. This is, this is flawless, this is textbook. Uh, yep. Yeah. It, but it, it's it's sometimes it has been known to fall apart. Well, uh, the handyman is here. The toilet shall be fixed. It will flush again. Oh, beautiful. So this is sort of the first position where you're playing on your own, and you remember like what the key ideas are here. Yeah. So typically here I'll play the yep. bishop move b7. Exactly, and it looks bad, right? Because you're staring at the pawn, but you're actually preparing to control the center with d5. Yep. Perfect. Yeah. He's terrified of that bishop like I am of dentists. Are you afraid of dentists? No, I'm, that not, I'm not that afraid of dentists. I, I was trying to find something I'm terrified of, but I'm actually not terrified of too many things. Oh, you're just too big of a man. I Dude, I'm, I'm like huge, man. I, I, have, I have no fears. Bugs. Wasps, actually. If you want to know. Mm, that makes sense. So now, like, you've played d5. That e-pawn wants to join the d but you can't play e5 immediately. So is there any way you can prepare that? Um, I can move my knight here, uh, but then it will probably just have an exchange. Yeah, and... that bishop on g7, that's your heart and soul. Yeah. Any other pieces that you could delegate that task? I could bring my rook in e8. Yeah, I like that idea. And I like that you put this rook on e8, because if you put the other rook on e8, then the, the f8 rook would have been kind of trapped. It also hangs that a7 pawn. That is true. Okay, so he's pre this guy's pretty competent. And so, mm -hmm. what I looked at here was pushing queen all the way up to f4, looking to attack that bishop since it's I love not protected. It. That's a good aggressive, energetic move. It's a little risky, but it you know it faces him with a decision, and you want to do as much of that as possible. Yeah, he's probably he seems like the kind of guy he likes to stop all the threats so this is how you want to play against people like him he's but he might go queen e3 he seems like a queen trade kind of guy or queen e5 yeah just if i'm getting the right read on okay bishop e5 now where do you want to park that queen because if you're already playing aggressively you want it preferably to be in an yeah. attacking position i was looking at b4 that's interesting that i actually like that move a lot you could also have gone to g5 um, and x-rayed his king, but it's really a matter of taste. Mm -hmm. Okay, that makes... Oh, I'm going to do b4 since that was the first one I yeah, saw. Yeah, no, I like that a lot. And you're continuing to attack his pawns. He's probably going to go like rook b1. Although he actually doesn't have to defend the b pawn, which is interesting. You're not really attacking it, but there we go. Yeah. 
Okay, the next move I was looking at was pushing this pawn to d4. Excellent, opening up the, your, your bishop. Like I said, you're you're an accelerated dragon natural. I'm, I've been really feeling the accelerated dragon here. I like it a lot. It's, I mean, it's gonna it's gonna bring you some doves in bog champs, I think. Assuming people don't play d4. Okay, this guy is playing really well too. So, okay, so he's attacking your d pawn, mm -hmm. and you have one more piece that you haven't brought into the game. Can you combine? The sort of two things together. Yeah. Uh, well, the my e rook isn't really doing anything right now. Uh, moving my a rook to d eight though, that would give him a free pawn at a seven. Is that something I should worry about? No. So actually, that pawn on a seven, it's sort of, uh, you know, it's it's collateral damage. It's the sort of thing you just have to give up in order to activate all of your pieces. And if you notice, like if he takes the pawn on a seven, his knight gets really out of place. Yeah. And uh, just that fact alone is worth giving that pawn over. And that a7 pawn is the least important pawn in the middle game. So you shouldn't you shouldn't give these pawn ups if you can avoid it. But uh, it's often not the end of the world. Okay. And yeah, this guy is very is definitely impressing me in the early going. But you're still in very good shape here. Okay, he takes it. So you can pretend basically that nothing happened because he's going to waste time evacuating his knight back to b5. And in that time, you can make uh, you can make further improvements in your position. Okay. So, so you can also actually win the pawn back. So notice that he has an undefended pawn on a2. Yeah, I was looking at a4, which attacks his knight and yep. that pawn. Perfect. Queen a4, queen a5 is both good. Hopefully he pays attention to the a pawn and not to his knight. But someone of Gomer Pyle's caliber... This oh, is a... I mean, you, you, know, you know Gomer. I mean, that guy, he's full of tricks. You know, it's like the most interesting man in the world. He can defend both his knight and his ape on at the same time. <laughs> he is the most interesting man in the world. Bishop c4 would be a really good move for him, this position. Would attack your queen, activate his bishop. Okay, bishop takes d4. Now you have a... You can make a dangerous move here. You can threaten checkmate, and you can also evacuate your queen while you're at it. Yeah, it's bringing it all the way to d5, yeah. Yeah. And you're not going to checkmate him. He's going to see that. He's going to probably play f3. But that induces a weakness on his king side. So that's a small victory for you. Okay. He, he didn't see it. Oh, my God. The Naroditsky jinx, man. The you're GMs do this. When I, when I, as soon as I compliment somebody, they blunder some crazy shit. It's literally the next move after you pay them a compliment. It's actually impressive that you're able to do that every single time. I'm going to tell. I'm going to pay someone to make a compilation of this because it's it's getting it's getting pretty absurd. I, I, honestly, I think it would be worth it to like go through the vods and find every example of one of these moments. <laughs> because usually, when I'm tilted or I'm frustrated, my way of expressing frustration is to say how good my opponent is, and that's the moment they blunder a rock or blunder into checkmate. That's a. That makes... I mean, he played really high level up until there. So let me just quickly, I have like two instructive moments to, to talk about, and then you can jump in for one more warm-up game. Okay. So I'll be quick. Mm, yeah. So, okay, so queen c7, beautiful. Uh, zero complaints here as to your play. Bishop b7, d5. This is, uh, and bishop d4 is a really nice move by him. Most people, they don't really notice that you're threatening e5. Uh, so rook e8 prepares e5. Queen f4 is a very nice move. Now, just to expand on the move queen g5, the reason I like this move is because it x-rays the king. But that's not the only mm. thing it does. If you look at this g2 pawn, what are you threatening here? If it's Let's make a random move for white. What would you do? I would have pushed my d pawn, which threatens mate, and if he blocks it, I win a knight. Exactly. Now, what if he blocks with a knight? Uh... How is the position? And when, when um, there's a lot of traffic like this, you want to really understand which pieces are now undefended. How has the position changed as a result of the last move? He's blocking his queen, so I just take the bishop. Bingo. The queen is blocking the bishop. Now I'm going to turn this around, and I'm going to ask you a challenging question. Let's say you're playing white and you've blundered this. Can white actually avoid losing a piece here? If I was a little bit more sadistic, the answer would be no, and I'd just make you sit there for 15 minutes. But the answer is yes. I have a funny story about that, but uh, first I want you to come up with a move. Okay. Hmm. I'm assuming it has to be an attack on the queen. Yes, and... you're absolutely correct. 
And it has to defend against checkmate in the so I think the only move that does that is bringing mm. I looked at blocking with the bishop, but that doesn't attack the queen. Right. So one of the miscons so one of the things people often miss, right? When you're attacking a pawn, uh Oh yep, I see. Go ahead. You just put you're pushing that pawn up to F four, huh? Exactly. Yep. yep. So it's it's hard to see this because you're opening up the queen's defense yep. of the pawn. Your brain is like, well I gotta push the pawn up or I gotta intercept the queen, but you can also defend the pawn that's being attacked. Yep, yep, yep. Very good. Yeah, so the, the story is, I was teaching my first ever chess camp, and that does exist, believe it or not. And this was like 2014, I, I didn't have much teaching experience. And I was really nervous, I was preparing all these positions, I was mapping every minute out. And so I finally, you know, come to the front, and I'm like, okay, we're gonna do, we're gonna start with a couple of puzzles. And this is like 10 kids, and they're pretty talented, so I really wanna do a good job. And I set up the first position, right? And I, I set it up wrong. I, I forgot to include a pawn. And that particular pawn changed completely the landscape of the position. So the solution that I had intended didn't work. And I'm sitting there for 15 minutes. Literally, I sat there for 15 I was like, man, these, I, I, was, I was told that these kids are talented. Um, <laughs> okay, I'm going to give them like five more minutes. And then I finally, I was like thinking about freaking pig turtles. And then I finally decided to look at the position. I was like, holy shit, where is the A pawn? And uh, I managed to get out of that situation without them knowing that I set the position up wrong because I wouldn't have made that out of the room in one piece. But uh, anyways, Jesus. no, I mean, they were really good kids. They would have forgiven me, but my, my ego didn't allow it. No, of course not. And that's just extremely embarrassing. Oh, yeah. I'm wasting 15 minutes of time of, of kids at chess camp. Just unthinkable. So anyways, that was one moment. The other moment was just... I wanted to ask you this. Why is, let's say he goes a3, that actually would have been a very high level move. Um, what would have happened if he take on b2? Uh, let's see. I take on b2. He's going to have to move that knight. or Well, no, he doesn't. It's protected by bishops. So right. He'd probably move the knight somewhere. Let's see. So he has three. He has basically four ways of trapping your queen here. Yeah, well, it starts with the knight, though, right? Or does it start with the rook? Both, you can start with both pieces and both trap the queen. Now, if you start with the rook, which rook do you want to put on b1? The a rook, right? Oh, no. So that, have... compare the two. Which, like, which one of them leaves something undefended and allows the queen yeah, to escape? Yeah. That'd be the other rook, because it hangs that pawn on a3. Exactly. So this is sort of the conventional way. But if you move the knight, you got to think about which escape squares you want to try to cover. Right, and the queen at the moment has only one escape square, so you just need to cover that escape square with the knight, either by intercepting it or by defend protecting with the knight. So the only escape square is that b6, right? Bingo. So, uh, where does the knight? Oh, you take on d. Yeah, you take on d5. Yep, that would be that would absolutely work. You could even go knight to a4. Which is a, d a double attack on the queen, but that's not what matters. What matters is that you cover the b6 square. Okay, okay. So, or even knight b5, uh, which would not cover the b6 square, but it would intercept the queen's access to it. Yeah, and it's still being attacked. So your queen is the piece you always want to keep an eye on. And when you're about to take a pawn like this, it's not that you never want to take it, but you've got to be extra careful about, about not getting your queen trapped. And if you're in trouble, one way and one set of tricks involves, you know, quote-unquote blundering a pawn like this. Because, you know, your opponents will often just take a pawn like this impulsively, and you may have cooked up a way to trap the queen. And that could be one way to turn a game around. Other than that, that was fantastic. We rook 88, you won the pawn back. Now, this pawn is a better pawn to capture, because the queen has two different escape routes, and white can't cover both of them at the same time. And uh, what would have been white's best move here? Last question. Really, white's only, almost white's only good way to defend against mate. Yeah, it's only pushing that pawn, right? F3? Yep, and that would have blunted your, your battery, but that would have weakened his king a little bit. So you have some compensation for the pawn. Mm -hmm. But bishop f6 was a move of unprecedented genius. and <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> okay, maybe one more game, and then we'll launch okay. into some, some drills. Sounds good. I'm hopping in. Perfect. I don't know if you want to put your 1,000 rating at Jeopardy, but... I, I've already lost it twice today. I, I think I'm more than fine losing it again. 
That's the attitude I like to hear. The Dutch, here we go. Yeah. So I actually feel really confident playing the Dutch. Oh, it's a great my, opening. Yeah, I find that my highest, I think it's probably my highest win rate is just mm -hmm. playing the Dutch. It's as good as it gets. And it's and it's unduly, unjustly criticized actually at a high level. It's, it's pretty hard even for GMs to get a good position against the Dutch. So H4, what he just played is a really good move, but he just, he didn't follow it up correctly. He's looking to get a pawn break, right? Yeah, I mean, I'll show you afterward. This is like the best line against it. I'll show you what the, the correct approach is, but you, you need to really analyze this carefully to know it. Okay. Okay. So the, the position hasn't really changed what I want to do here. I still want to nope. open up on E5. Yep, so, you want to prepare it. So I go D6 and then I'm pushing E5. Well, okay, so he goes e4 himself, and now you have to react dynamically to what he's done. Yeah, uh, I mean, he gave me this fork. Oh, no, okay. didn't I? Nice yeah, cover. but taking was still correct. I mean, you have to release the tension. And now you have to ask yourself, like, the obvious thing is, do you want to trade knights on e4? Do you have to? Do you gain anything from taking on e4? No. And if, if the answer is no, then you can just develop your pieces. That's what people often don't realize. It's like, let that traffic just be there on e4. Let him take your knight. So how would you develop yours in the most uh, natural way? C6. Excellent. Wait, did I just compliment you? Shit. <gasps> yeah. Wait, let me get my knight. Okay, so again, the, your, your opponent said they're playing well. So he wants to blast open your king side and there's basically two ways of thinking about this. You can actually, you can try to actively prevent him from doing that, or you can counter strike. Mm -hmm. And counter striking can be the most effective form of defense. Do you see a counter strike here? I was looking at pinning knight to queen, taking pawn d4. That's not, and I'll show you why after the game, but you want something that carries a little bit more weight. You want to attack one of his pieces. And you okay. don't forget it because this is your main idea. You've been preparing this for three moves now. I still do want to just push this yeah. five. That's okay. an independently good move because you're occupying the center. Look at his knight on f3 and his bishop on d3. What can you tell me about them? Uh, they're in a very forkable position. They're in an ex extremely forkable position. And if he plays this correctly, then he should sacrifice a piece and get an attack for it. But that's a very, very difficult sort of thing to orchestrate. All right, I got my red pen out. Now you're, now you're screwed. Uh oh. Okay. Let's talk about ten. Yeah. So if I were him, I might actually take the pawn on g6 and leave the bishop on f4, sacrifice it in order to open up your king side. Okay. So he takes this way. Ah, but he can actually save his piece. But we'll see if he finds it. So he can give you a check on c4 with his light squared bishop and remove it from its workable position. <gasps> oh, don't tell him. He's in the stream. He's, in the, he's definitely in the stream. I always have this paranoia. <laughs> it's, per, it's a perpetual paranoia. But then, And then I learn I sometimes will say like a bad move just as a test. I have another story about that, but let me shut up. We have, we have work to do. Yeah, it's serious business time, Daniel. It's, it is... I don't know, I've lost my Russian edge. Thank you, Shebaum, for the prime. Okay, but I think he's freaking out. I think that his time consumption indicates to me that he's... he's Okay, no. I, okay, but you want to find the best... I mean, resigning is an option here, but you want to find the best... Now, remember there are three ways to deal with the check. Yeah. You can move your king. You can take wow. the piece that's giving the check, which you can't hear. Or you can intercept the check. Yeah. I was thinking block is better, but then if I do that, I lose the control over e5 because I'd have to block with bishop. Okay, but you lose the rook's control over e5, but how many times is e5 controlled nonetheless? Uh, two attackers, I see. Okay, so And two defenders. Yeah. Exactly. And that's a good move because you develop your bishop. Now, he can trade queens. That's not a big deal. You get an endgame. But you, yeah. at least you've got all of your pieces developed. All right, and you're also continually attacking his pieces, so you're you're forcing him to spend a lot of time working through the chaos here. 
Okay. I think you that's have something I need to work on is counting, because I thought by blocking the rook, I would lose the exchange. But yeah, right. I see I would come out on top. Yeah, it's kind of sometimes unintuitive that, you know, equal number of attackers and defenders is good for the defenders. Um, and and there are things that change that, obviously. There's tactics that, you know, that change it. But, but in general, that's the rule of thumb. And I'll note that down. Maybe I'll, I'll be able to come up with some positions on that. Okay. Uh, I was looking at just pushing this pawn again. It attacks the knight and attacks b2. Fantastic. And he's uncastled here, so it's very, very good that you're now grabbing the initiative. Thank you, the screeching weasel. And now his knight has no good squares either. He can't go to g5. Man, this Dutch is in your hands is just a... I don't even know how to describe it. I'm tongue-tied. Okay. That's a pretty savvy move, actually. Hmm. So in this position, do I just want to take that pawn and just get something out of this? Um, oh. You can take the pawn, but I would say that your top priority is probably to renew the attack on his knight. And what do you need to do to do in order to accomplish that? Uh, I need like to get the rook out of this x-ray. Or you need to defend the rook. Now, okay. in doing that, you also want to activate another one of your pieces. So which piece do you think that might be? Um, I see I can bring my knight in at d4. It attacks the queen, protects the rook as but well. But that allows him to, to take on d4. That gives his knight an out. Uh, so yeah, I, would use your, I would use your queen. And I would use your queen to defend your rook. But while you're doing that, you might as well bring your queen to a really nice spot in the center of the board. Okay, so all the way up to d5 then? Bingo. Because, and does it make sense that you don't want to trade knights? You want his knight to to not have an escape route. Because it, it's going to have to go back to like h2 or g1, which is pretty disastrous. Okay. And then you have a really big attack. Now, if he does that, I wouldn't even bother taking the pawn on b2. I would look for moves that are even more active. And I would understand, okay, when his knight moves back like that, which squares can you now access maybe with your pieces, your knight? That can give you... A very strong attacking move, potentially. Yeah, so then that's that d4 I wanted Bingo. to play. Yeah, you're just going to crush him here. You also can actually win his knight, funnily enough, because he, he put it on h4. I didn't even notice that. When he moves his queen, depending on where he moves it, y you can actually trap that knight. Okay, so he's given you a chance to do something even better. So I looked at this fork at C2. Yeah. I imagine this is the best that's going to get. I believe so. Okay, cool. Well, this is better than roses on Valentine's Day. This is the best gift anyone can give me, is just watching a fork in action. Oh, uh, you know what would be even better is if he moves his king to... Oh. I was going to say, if he moved it to, like, F1, then I'd also get the bishop. <laughs> the bishop. Well, yeah. But then he would get your rook on e6. Okay, so this is an important moment, actually. you got to be very careful here. I call this the umbrella method. You see his pawn on g6. Yeah. If his pawn on g6 were not there, your king would be in check. It would be nasty. You want to make sure that you are letting his pawn on g6 act as the protection to your king. How can you mm -hmm. ensure that that's the case? By pushing my own pawn. Now, would you push it to h6 or h5? Uh, it looks like h6 is the safest. Well, are you sure about that? Yeah, I mean, go go h6. Uh, no, I see, because then the bishop <laughs> takes, and I can't control that square right now anyway. Okay, so h5. Okay. The, the actual reason h5 is better isn't because bishop takes, but we'll talk about that after the game. Okay. That's, that's a pretty instructional moment, I think. Oh, that's a genius move. Did you see that queen sacrifice? That was just sexy. <laughs> that was hey. just... He had 18 seconds. I, my fucking heart breaks for him, man. That shit happens to me all oh, the time. Oh, God. Now another discovered check. Oh, yeah, God. Oh, you're looking, just mopping the floor here. It's not looking good for the boy wonder. I'm just nope. going to keep delivering checks until it's over, I think. Yep, you could have also taken his knight, but you've you've lined your pockets enough here, I think. You can go after oh, that. I just so. gave him my queen. <laughs> it's all good. <laughs> I, I, I've perfected that. I mean, with 0.1 seconds, you make the most absurd move. Yeah. And you know what? what's even the dirtiest trick? And I had a student who did that, and I shut that shit down immediately. He would So his opponent would get to one second. And this is an old, this has existed for 20 years now. 
Uh, when I was growing up and playing on the Internet Chess Club, which is like the old server, people were doing that. You offer your opponent a draw, and then you immediately checkmate him. Like before he has a chance to react to it, you immediately give checkmate, or you make a move and he loses on time. Pretty I fucked mean, up. That's like, for a chess player, I know people are like, what? But for a chess player, that's like a huge insult. Like that is like next level trolling. Um, Did you give them a, a harsh spanking? Take them over your knee? You know, I that that stuff just doesn't fly with me. Like you, you try that shit, or you tell me you do that during a lesson. I'm shutting that down immediately. You're gonna play like a like a respectful Russian schoolboy. <laughs> if you're part of the Nerdisky army. Okay. So let me invite you to another board. You said I could have taken his knight. Yes, so, you could have trapped his knight. Okay, so then just... Alright, I think I see. So just take, it's check, he has to take, then I take back. Yeah, yeah. and we'll, okay. we'll run through that line. So this move h4, right? He, I, I was surprised he played it. And the best move for him here is actually h5. Very difficult to understand why this is a good move. Because it seems to blunder a pawn. Now, which, which way would you take this pawn if you were black here? You just take with the the knight, right? Because then it Definitely frees up the bishop knight. to attack. Well, that's not the main reason, right? Because the bishop is still not such a great piece. It's biting on granite. But yes, you're mm -hmm. right. The other reason is you don't want to take with a pawn because you're probably going to castle kingside and you don't want to ruin your structure like that, right? You don't want to leave this pawn weak. I'm yeah. not, as you know, I don't really give a shit about pawn structure, but I give a shit about it if, if it relates to your king safety. Um... And after knight takes h5, there's a crazy move, rook takes h5. This is an exchange sacrifice. Okay. And after you take the rook, how, does, how do you think he follows up? He takes with the queen, delivering a check. Right, you have to move the king, and now... He takes the pawn, delivering another check. Bingo. And it, it, white is not winning here, it's not mate. But white has a very strong long-term attack against black's gang. And you're only up in exchange, right? You're not up like five rooks here. Right. So according to my analysis, and it's funny because I analyzed this recently with, with uh, my highest rated student, and he was preparing against the Dutch. White is, white is better here, but it, it's playable. I mean, it's, it's a very double-edged position. In any case, he played knight f3 first, you castle. Now, one question I have for you is that you start with rook e8, which is, to my knowledge, a little bit awkward is there okay. any reason that you didn't start with and let me check this right now actually because he played something that your opponents might actually play let me let me actually look at my notes to see if i analyze this yeah so after castles okay the best move is is to start with d6 okay. and the best way to understand why is that if you move your rook to e there's just something about this move that looks very awkward right you're the only purpose of this move is to prepare e5. Whereas if you play a move like d6, you want to start with the most flexible move. This move not only prepares e5, it opens up your bishop, it controls a little bit of the center. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah, makes sense. So you want to start with d6, and then you want to play rook e8, and then knight, knight c6. It's just a very small nitpicky note. Okay. Okay, so bishop d3. Now, if he would have given you a check, how would you have reacted here? Block with the pawn e6. Excellent. Now, can you tell me why you wouldn't play this move? This is a dreadful mistake. Uh, I mean, it looks like shit. Like, yeah, you're completely it, locked in now because that bishop can just keep that locked. Yeah, it looks like hot sewage, but how do you actually how do you actually punish that? Um, you're not, you're not going to get off the hook just by telling me it looks like shit, like you're some <laughs> grandmaster. You're going to tell me why it's bad. I would guess that you try and bring that f3 knight into the attack here. It has a, a nice square at g5. Now you're speaking a language I love and understand. So actually, knight e5 is even stronger. Okay. And there's a kind of a mind-blowing reason why. And this will lead me to a very important point that I want you to apply in Pogchamps. And uh, I think it's going to stand behind some of your success. Okay. So what is the first thing you see in this position? It's the fork. If that's if uh, f7 isn't defended, it's a fork and you win the queen. So you have to defend that with the, the rook. Exactly. But giving this fork, let me make an analogy. Let's say you've just won the lottery and you live close to the lottery office. I don't know where you cash in a lottery. And you decide to bike to the lottery office to cash in your million dollar ticket. And on the way, you see a hundred dollar bill that lies on the ground. And you're like, holy shit. So you, you get so excited that you drop your lottery ticket and it flies away into the ocean. 
and you pick up the hundred dollar bill and you're like i'm awesome so knight f7 check is like favoring a hundred dollar bill over a lottery ticket now when you okay. have a situation like this you always have to understand and put things into context what are you actually winning with white by playing this move uh so i mean then you're only winning the rook you're giving two pieces for a rook here two pieces for a rook be more accurate so rook takes f7 bishop f7 what what is this called you're trapped you now just play that pawn but what is white up right now it's not a rook and it's not oh, two pieces exchange. for a rook in exchange exchange. but black's gonna win a second piece very probably and even mm -hmm. if black didn't win a second piece up in up in exchange is great but it's not amazing and here white can do something to be completely winning and it's a very strong attacking move that i just showed you in this very game white can play this move again with even greater effect oh you just push that pawn up and you do that to open up the h file you as you already pointed out black king has no escape and after knight takes h5 white has a very pretty mating sequence um i want you to think about it and it all occurs with checks I'm, that's a hint that i'm going to give you so from this point forward it all occurs with checks or all occurs you... with checks no nope, from this point forward and it's forced mate and it's a little challenging, but I think you got this. So the first check that you deliver has to be g6 with the knight, right? Yep, and you do that in order to reposition this h pawn. Mm -hmm. And then you deliver a check with the queen here on h5. Okay, you're on the right track, but do you need to sacrifice the queen? Uh, I guess you do the rook first, then the queen. Yeah, so in general, even okay. if queen takes worked, you're you're playing to win games, not to paint pictures. So gotcha. it's, it's important to give yourself an abundance of caution so rook takes G and queen takes would not have worked and i'll show you why in just a second now what now you take with the queen delivering another i checking, have the so. pit pitiful defensive move bishop h6 uh you just take with the queen yeah this is a pathetic i mean look at black's pieces it's like okay. you haven't made any moves um so the reason that queen h5 wouldn't have worked is because after bishop h6 white uh, may it, actually it, still be winning white is still winning but after rook h6, black's king has a new lease yeah, on life. Escape square. Uh... So the lesson here, and I'll show you where you could have applied this in the game, is that when you see something like mediocre, like you can win an exchange, you want to take 10, 15 seconds and put things into context and ask yourself whether you can't go for more. And don't go crazy. Like if you're not sure or you can do something risky, maybe it's worth just winning the exchange, but at least put it some thought. Okay, so bishop d3, does that make sense? Yeah. And I'll give you a chance to do that. So bishop f6, e5 is great. Now, knight takes d4 would have been a bad idea because you haven't completed your development and your king is wide open, which means after knight d4, bishop d4, I notice two things. I notice your king, yeah. and I notice the fact that this bishop is undefended. And how can white combine the two things? He delivers a check. I have to move. He wins that bishop with queen. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And that's just crushing. So it's very important that you win e5. You counterstruck here. Bishop e6 is good. e4 is perfect. This is example number one. Your eyes are drawn as are mine to the pawn. But I tell myself, here I just went a pawn and he can move his rook and he gets another tempo. But I can do a lot more than a pawn because his king is uncastled, his queen is susceptible to this move. And so queen d5 is much stronger. And after knight h4, how could you have trapped his knight if you wanted to? Your move was the best, but nonetheless. Yeah, you just push the pawn, right? He has no more squares. Exactly, push the pawn up to g5. But instead, you went knight c4. And then the second instance of where you could have applied this principle is here. So you instantly played knight takes a1, which I understand. Now, in Russia, this would have gotten your, you know, one of your less essential organs uh, tampered with. But um, I will be a little bit more forgiving because I get the appeal of that. Could you have... But let's say you can't take the rook. Forget about that for a second. Could you propose something stronger? Uh, so what I looked at here is pushing the queen to d3, actually. That is prob yeah, that is a good move. That is a great start. The king goes to d1. Now be very careful. Okay. Um... Yeah, I muted myself. He is, he is sharp right now. He's seeing stuff like he's never seen before. I'm pretty optimistic. Well, now if I... Well, now I can take the rook and that now blocks the king. Okay, and but look at the whole board. Him. How has the position changed as a result of queen e3? Have you left anything uh, undefended? Rook is, unde rook is undefended. So immediately you're like, okay, I need to move my rook and I need to do it with yep. tempo. How can I do it? 
looks like the best square for the rook would be right behind the queen here at d6 and then taking the bishop. Exactly. So he has to bring his queen back. And then you have a great choice. You could, Now you can take the rook and you win the entire rook and you force the queen trade. That's a much better version of what you did. Mm -hmm. uh, so that would be one example. And the other thing you could do, what would I actually do in this position? Um, I You could actually start with the move rook d8. Which might seem like weird to be like, why of all the things you could do, you do this move? Well, the point is that if his bishop moves away, black to play. You have to choose one of about 18 ways to checkmate him. Yeah, God. Uh, well. What are the king's escape squares? So right now the king only has f, or he only has. Um, Take the square f1. away. That's it. I don't Move. see how we do that. Oh, I just delivered the same check. I delivered yeah. at d three. Exactly. Or you can deliver one at c four. That's yeah. why I put the rook on d eight, by the way, so that the king can't come out, come over here, and so that the king can come back to d one. Okay. Or yeah. you could even deliver it here. So with, when you sense the mate, uh, be methodical. Where can the king escape? How can I take away the escapes? And if you can't find a way to do it, don't panic and go nuts. Even taking the rook here is better because I see a lot of people, they, they can't see the mate and then they just do something absolutely wild. Um, you could also play e3, just throw a pawn at him and weaken him even further. And if he defends with a rook on d1, what can you do here? Mm. It's still delivering the same check, right? It's still mate. Nothing yeah. changed. And again, the point of rook d8 is to force him to cover up the d1 square where he previously could have escaped. Okay. So, okay, so that, all right, that makes sense. Yeah. So the rook d8. Yeah, yeah, that was the move that I would have actually played. Rook d1. Rook d8. He can avoid mate for a little longer, but uh, but but not for very long. 